Uh, thank you much, uh, very much, Tim. Thank you for this beautiful space here. Thank you to the organizers for TEDx. Uh, thank you, Traverse City. Today I'm going to explore some of the backstory, if you like, some of the threads involving the history of popular culture and television that were addressed by Paul and uh, by Tom here. And uh, my topic is the rise and rise of factual television. So this rise has been so spectacular that we're not even sure what to call it. Some people call it factual, others call it non-fiction television because it's not supposed to be made up. Documentary is of course central to the uh, central tradition to the, to the uh, development of the whole area. And unscripted because it's not supposed to be scripted like uh, a movie or, a, um, or a, uh, a movie of the week or a situation comedy and such. But we're going to call it factual or documentary in this presentation. And then increasingly the word content is being used because television is being uh, distributed on the internet and all kinds of platforms. But we're not sure about the word content so we're going to keep calling it television. So my experience in this field of documentaries dates back to the 70s when I was a teacher in a really tough uh, working class high school, a technical high school in the western suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. And most of our students were the children, I was uh, teaching middle school, 7th and 8th grade, most of our students were the children of European immigrants who had very poor uh, language skills. They were neither the parents' language uh, and they, their English language skills were very, very weak. So teaching, uh, teaching them to say the least was incredibly chaotic, sometimes dangerous experience. And the only time that I ever really, we can run that uh, little video now, the only time that I ever had any peace of mind and really started to see the kids was get getting engaged was when I threaded up my Bell and Howell projector, turned the lights down, and the flickering screen told a story that my words and my lack of classroom control couldn't overcome. And so <coughs> I became deeply committed to the, the ability of audiovisual media, film and television, particularly documentaries and good documentary storytelling to transform lives because I could see these kids get some hope out of the education process. So a couple of years later, uh, I was, say, 1980, I was fortunate enough to get a small grant to come over to New York to further my studies about documentaries, how they were, produ how they were produced at the time and how they were distributed, particularly educational documentaries. And at that time, the number one documentary film festival in the States was called the American Film Festival and the curators of the American Film Festival, the organizers of it, were the Educational Film Librarians Association. So what was incredible was that at that time there were two big separate gatekeepers for whether you got your documentary produced and distributed. On the one hand there were ed the, the the uh, librarians and they were either school librarians or they were community librarians. Nearly all women, nearly all very well educated with liberal arts degrees and also some library science. And you needed to get a good rating from their association and from their festival to have your documentary picked up and distributed whereupon they were either the films uh, which were shipped around the states in these big boxes, they were either rented or they were purchased by these libraries. So at that era, the gatekeeper number one is the librarian. Gatekeeper number two were a handful of television executives. PBS was just emerging in the late 80s, but the BBC had been a powerful uh, producer and funder of, of documentary programming for many years, coming out of Britain's very f um, you know, deep and passionate documentary production tradition. And also there was public television uh, networks like ABC Australia, CBS Canada, and uh, to a lesser extent in, um, in uh, Europe, in France and Germany and other territories. There was just a handful of decision makers in these networks. Most of them, say in the UK, the really powerful ones, 
went to Oxford and Cambridge and probably knew each other back to their Eton days. So they were also a very, very small circle. And kind of that was it. So um, there were some kind of independent productions, but it was a very small and tightly run universe. So I'm just going to take you through some of the spectacular growth that's occurred since. So this was the slide we just went through. It was really a cottage industry where our gatekeepers were librarians and TV news executives. And if you took all of these businesses and you, and you, and you put them on the block and you auctioned them off, you know, I just, my guesstimate is that the value of all of those production companies and distribution companies involved in educational and documentary film at the time would have been about $100 million. So in the 80s, we saw two unbelievable technical revolutions. The first one was home video. Uh, a new home video platform emerged uh, in two formats, VHS or beta, which were extremely convenient and they allowed people to buy or rent and also produce, distribute to involve in a whole series of activities around topics that had never been covered in the era of these two, uh, in, the, in the previous era. And whole new niches emerged with passionate followings that became very viable in the marketplace. A really good example is military. There were lots of military buffs. World War II veterans were passionate about getting hold of stories about their, their war experiences. The same with Korea. Aviation buffs. And then on the how-to side, there was cooking, cuisine, and uh, gardening, and uh, fitness, and other areas like that. And then there were even really narrow niches. You know, one of my favorites was uh, train enthusiasts had a whole genre in which, they, in which there were distributors making decent money, in which they just had a camera in the cabin of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a train engine as it went from, say, Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. And they had highlights of the big bends, uh, the big turns, and, and so on. So even very, very fine niches became viable for people if they had the right cost structure. So that was the first big event in the 80s. And the second, which was incredible, was the establishment of a network in the States which became the industry leader. It was, the, f it was the, f the first to really become viable, and that was Discovery Channel. And we forget that there was a ton of competition out there for this space. There were lots of channels emerging. Lots of them wanted, lots of pe uh, uh, people in New York wanted to found a documentary network, but they couldn't get the plan right. You know, like they'd commit to original programming, which was unaffordable given the advertising revenue and the subscription revenue that was available at the time. But Discovery came in and totally nailed it for two reasons, in my view. And um, I was blessed with being introduced to uh, Discovery just, I'd say, a couple of years after their foundation. First of all, they had an unbelievable brand. The word Discovery kind of said it all. And secondly, their presentation conveyed a, a feeling about expectation that they were going to do their best to give you the world's best, most absorbing programming in categories that you got glimpses of on television, but they were going to do it 24 by 7, seven days a week. And, you know, and those categories, you know, we're familiar with wildlife, archaeology, uh, history, adventure, um, people and places, uh, big travel, all of these kinds of fields. And Discovery's brand said, watch us, and we mightn't be there yet, but have faith in us and we'll deliver. So one of the first program, and I'd, I'd say the, the second really important um, aspect of this promise that Discovery nailed was that they acquired programs that indicated the direction that they wanted to become. So the market couldn't afford to go out and commission these original productions at hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they acquired programs that sh showed this direction they were moving. And one of the examples that I really loved, it was one of Discovery's uh, first um, big acquisitions of a library, and it, uh, it generated terrific feedback at the time through phone calls and postcards and, and word of mouth and all the rest, was um, a naturalist from my home country called uh, Harry Butler. So I was just going to share you a clip with um, featuring Harry Butler that kind of shows you 
the discovery promise, but at this very nascent acquisitions era uh, level. One of the wonderful things about walking through the bush is you never know what you're going to see next. In this case, it's one of the most delightful small animals you could get. Pygmy possums. They really are delightful things. You probably wonder why they're not running away from me. The reason is the blossoms they're feeding on have been in the hot sun and the nectar in them has fermented. <laughs> These little fellows have eaten the fermented nectar and in fact they're drunk. <laughs> There you go. So you can see the, I can say this, you can't. The pygmy possum says a lot about my fellow countrymen. It's a symbol, symbol for a major pastime uh, back home. But, uh, you know, so, you know, here's the, you can see it's engaging, lovely programming, and people were attracted to it in sufficient numbers to make this network viable. And also, um, uh, you know, the savings were, were enormous because, Discovery wasn't involved in original production. And then other networks came in, A&E at the same time, they started to, uh, to, to cover similar fields. A&E means arts and entertainment, they were originally a, an, arts ent uh, an arts network. So they were kind of feeling their way. So at the end of the 80s, I've got us growing, you know, maybe five times through these two niches, but to, uh, through these two, you know, major forces that were starting to be duplicated in other places in the world. So then we go to um, the 90s and we get lots more niche channels, food, a house and garden, uh, entertainment, lots of other channels that schedule a ton of non-fiction entertainment programs. Not necessarily a classic documentaries, but they were trying to find their way with the programming that appealed to their audiences. The other big move in the 90s is the big shift in Discovery and also A&E away from acquired programs like Harry Butler to creating programs for American audiences or for international audiences as well. And so there was a big shift towards commissioning original productions in Discovery. And, you know, by the end of the 90s, there was relatively little uh, acquired programs. You know, the Harry Butler type libraries were um, well and truly in the rear view mirror. And the other thing that happened in the 90s, again led by Discovery, beginning in the late 80s, was that um, the big US brands that were related to factual TV went global. So they launched in the UK, um, Europe, Middle East, North Africa, Latin America, Australia, everywhere else. And this started to create uh, real value. So the next, in the 2000s, you know, just remember, um, I'm not an advocate of um, I'm not an advocate of the quality of some of the st some of the programming that came in, comes through. I'm trying to give you a sense of the economics of of, uh, of popular culture as it relates to TV. There was this incredible creative explosion, whereby really great storytelling became applied to um, uh, in in ways that just totally absorbed people in the material. And um, Paul's uh, Deadliest Catch is probably, you know, an amazing archetypal program. It deals with, with fishing and with, um, with Alaska and a whole series of themes. I mean, the informational takeaways are huge, but at the end of the day, it's just a, a gripping drama about, you know, men at work, and it really appealed to the male audience that uh, the network was targeting. So <coughs> these... these in this kind of explosion of creativity about storytelling, a lot of it, I would say, was the, the, um, the tacky end of the, of the reality uh, spectrum, you know, tacky to quality. Um, but also more nets came into the business, more networks were established that scheduled non-fiction TV of, of all types, and networks which had previously been entertainment networks, uh, like uh, TBS or USA, they also started to look for ways of creating 
uh, character-based and reality programs. And then the final explosion was that um, Discovery several years ago went public, and so we had Wall Street finance involved. And you know, my estimate is that worldwide, you know, this sector, because remember there are replicants of this model in France and the UK and elsewhere, that we're talking about a $120 billion market. And I just see all of that coming out of you know, my initial experience with the Educational Librarians Association. So I've just about run out of time. I've surprised myself here. But I want to show you one clip before I go. Can you, can you show the, um, the clip for um, the birds clip from Australia? I'm sorry I didn't look at the clock there. What bird has the most elaborate, the most complex, the most beautiful song in the world? And I guess there are lots of contenders, but this bird must be one of them. The superb lyrebird. To persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. Even the original is fooled. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. So uh, I've done my time. I've got another four hours in which I could share all this stuff with you. It's really great to talk. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you.